Welcome to Needham School Spotlight. I'm Dan Goodykanst, Superintendent of Schools. Joining me today are several students who are involved in the Social Empowerment Active Listening Club at Needham High School. Welcome. Thank you. So, Blessing, I want to start with you so you can tell us what the SEAL Club is all about. Well, basically, um, we're a group of like-minded students, and um, our goal is to just talk about and advocate for social change in the community and even in the Needham High School. So um, we see ourselves as like an arm of the district, um, kind of like going towards, um, walking towards so cultural proficiency in Needham. We see ourselves as advocates of change for students in the school and people who identify th themselves with like different um, social groups and social cultures. And we just want to make a Needham High like a welcoming place for all different types of cultures and social groups. Excellent. Um, so how did this group, the five of you and others involved, come about? What was the impetus for that? How did that? How did that get started? Well, we actually Hi. started. We actually started at, um, from the GB So Camp treat that happened last year. All right, GB So Camp. So everyone knows Greater Boston Students of Color Achievement Network. Yeah. Okay, GB So Camp. It's a mouthful. And, like, it was pretty much just like. It was like a day full of like programs having to do with like cultural proficiency and diversity and like what we and yeah and like one thing at the end of the retreat that they told us is that we have to think of ideas of what we can do to change the culture in our school or in our community in our school our community or like our district community and we came up with the idea to start a club that does that just as an addendum to that, um, I personally was invited to the GB SOCAN meeting um, from an African American Studies class that I was taking at Needham High at the time. So my journey kind of started a little earlier in that class. Um, that is a, was actually the first year that it was being taught last year. And it was really good and eye-opening, and that's kind of how I learned about the whole uh, attempt to start some kind of movement like that in the school. Well, you know, I, I, I want to focus on the on the on the title of your club because it's it's the piece that you talked about, blessing social empowerment, social justice. But the active listening, what's what what's what's that all about, uh, Renato? What, what do we mean by active listening, and how does that tie into the social justice piece? Well, first off, I want to say thank you for taking the time out of um, your schedule. I know you're a very busy man, um, and I, I I like I think what the school has to improve on is just improving on like you know taking different perspectives from different different like shoes in this school like predominantly Needham High School is like a white school and the Meco students or college students are seen as minority and very few people uh, have like can see the perspective from Meco student and just in daily lives just as like waking up and going to school or just going home like there are two different roles and like paths that each person has to take. So I feel like if the, the active listener is that um, we strive for the students to not only like take, take a different perspective but to also like understand that their journeys are different. So and maybe and possibly to learn even more. Cindy. Mm -hmm. Did I get that? Yes. Okay good. <laughs> So one of the terms that Blessing and Tasha were using was um, cultural proficiency, which I, I think somehow ties in the social empowerment active listening. I've heard that term a lot lately, cultural proficiency. What do you think it means? Or help, help me understand. So pretty much it's kind of just understanding everyone's own background. Like here in our group, we're all from very diverse backgrounds. Like Blessing's Nigerian, I'm Cape Verdean, Tasha's Haitian, Renato's Hispanic, and Jacob's Russian. So it's like a whole bunch of different like cultures like put together to make this one big group. And it's kind of like a lot of people don't notice the different cultures and like different kind of ethnic groups that are at the school. And they kind of see it as one big like white minority group, but it's like there's a whole bunch of stuff mixed in there as well, which doesn't really have its own voice, which is kind of what we're here for. So even within the different uh, groups, I mean, you just pointed out really different cultural and, and uh, national origins of, of folks. And, and some, some folks might just say, well, it's a black-white issue, but actually what you're suggesting is that there's, they're deeper, there's a deeper understanding of people and, and who they are and where they've come from and the relationships they have. So that's part of what you're, you're trying to do here. So what are some of the activities that SEAL has been involved in 
at Needham High School. I mean, what role so far in the last year or so, because you've been around for about a year, uh, what role have you played? What are what are some of the uh, you know what are some of the things, uh, Tasha, that that uh, you've been involved in? Well, we haven't necessarily like done anything like actively yet, but we like have ideas and like we're working. Well, what, you've had some conversations with the administration, and, and uh, tell me about what some of those conversations have, have been about. Well, they've been about like incidents that we feel at the school, that have happened at the school that we feel like should have been made a bigger deal than what they seem than what they were. Okay. We, yeah, I, personally I feel like um, we have had an opportunity to sort of test the waters of what SEAL can be, but not fully take on that role. Yeah. And in that sense, we've definitely seen that the administration is willing to listen. Um, and, you know, the next step to listening is being active about the listening. So um, we definitely feel like we have been, it's been brought to our attention that, you know, certain events take place, certain things that make people feel very uncomfortable that have to do with a lack of compassion or mindfulness on behalf of other students or other um, staff, whatever, in the community. And it's just, we feel like it's part of our responsibility and part of the point of the group to sort of bring to the attention of the administration how that makes people feel and bring in some other perspectives, not just the disciplinary roles, but you know, students and peers and how they feel about it. So, I, again, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the title of your group, the Social Justice Peace and Empowerment, which is a great word, and then the act of listening. I mean, you've combined two really powerful notions for high school students to think about. Tasha, you suggest that, that you've been meeting with the administration, you're organized to maybe be a sounding board for ideas, um, which I think is actually pretty noble and is doing a lot of work already. Um, but you, you allude to, and, and Jacob, you as well, that uh, you know maybe some incidents or some issues. Now, every high school around the country, um, regardless of where the, the high school is, there are issues that come up. Um, and, and often the response is discipline. You know, this is how we'll deal with, you know, you broke the rules, here, here's, the, here's the discipline, here's the consequence. Um, but it sounds like there, there might be more than that. I mean, what, what are some of the things that you individually or collectively have expressed concern about uh, to the high school administration, to Dr. PZ, that you, you'd like to be involved in or you'd like to help out with? What, let's, what are some specifics? Well, I think um, in school, some people think it's like kind of natural, or like the thing to do to just like joke around with racial jokes. So we have brought that um, to the administration and how we feel like, because people around school think, oh, like we can make this joke and it's just, just, just the culture. But for some people, we feel like that's not the culture and it's very like hurtful. Um, sometimes, so it's one of the things that we brought up. So we'd like to see the like, change in that aspect, and like kind of educate people and show people that it's not just a joke, and that it actually affects us and how we feel. So I'm going to push a little bit, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by a joke? What it, What is something that you have heard in 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 the Needham schools that's been hurtful, if you don't mind, or any one of you? Um. So well, recently, um, we had an incident, and someone said that one of the words that one of my friends used was a ghetto word and that like it's not a word that would be used in Needham but that it would be a word that would be used in Boston and I kind of felt offended because words are words whether it's ghetto or not and I kind of felt that he was saying that I'm ghetto just by saying oh that's a word that a type of word that you would use and he was saying that uneducated people would use that word but I would freely use that word and I see myself as very educated so that really got me agitated and like I really got my feelings into that and he felt like it was normal like that was what it was like that was a ghetto word I'm ghetto and I'm uneducated because I use that word but I don't feel that way so maybe he didn't think that but the way that he said it and the way that um, he approached the situation made it seem as if he was calling me ghetto and that's how I felt about it. He treated it like a joke and it wasn't Yeah it wasn't a joke at all. I feel like like another personal thing that happens to me because um I'm I'm Latino and people think like the first thing they, like some of my friends ask me is oh were you born here? It's like based off the color of my skin you're just gonna ask me that. Like, that's that's not cool. And, and another incident is like they always, they always joke around like oh you must have hopped the border or, 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 once you got here. But like 
like what so your guideline to giving somebody to think that somebody jumped over the border is because of the color of their skin it's like they, they obviously don't know how that feels but like sometimes i get like peeved and stuff so so if you don't mind push on yeah. a little bit about that so you hear a comment like that you, you, you jump over the border and do you is it being said do you believe in jest do you do you go along? Do you laugh along? What do you What do you say in response to that? Well, I don't really. I don't laugh along. Like sometimes, like I do, or like sometimes, like it's natural. Like I sometimes I'm used to hearing a song, just like I just don't listen to them. But sometimes I'm like, that's not fair. Like just don't say that next time. Like you don't know how it feels. Like do you know what you just said? And after I like explain to them, like oh yeah, like you know, no, my parents never jumped over the border. They actually came here by plane from. Um, by and see from like the problems they had in their country, and they're like, "Oh, I didn't know that." I'm like, "Well, yeah. Well, watch what you say next time." Like the word, I think the best thing to to do is not just to like get up all on their face and get mad. It's just instead just educate them themselves and make them like understand like, "Oh, you know, I messed up." So yeah, make them active listeners. Yeah. Yes. To 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 what you're trying to say, rather than just dismiss it or shrug it off. Although I would imagine all of you have had to shrug off. Different comments or incidences that that, that have occurred. Um, but Jacob, I, I want I want to push on you a little bit. What what have you in your in your time at, at Newton High School and in, in the Newton schools? What have you witnessed or or observed or felt? Um, well, as a white male, I know that it's very easy, without even realizing it, to fall into a sort of comfortable bubble of ignoring how other people feel in the community because from a very young age we have this supportive shelter around us that um, maybe we're encouraged to be more culturally proficient here and there on and off but generally we, we it's easy to get by and not pay too much attention to the issues that come up on a daily basis for many other people and part of it I think is that we have a very competitive um, paradigm of education. It's very much based on competition, promoting yourself, sort of winning, being the best. And right away, as soon as we come to school, we start, because of that, thinking about ourselves and our egos and how we can preserve ourselves. And a lot of times that doesn't encourage, um, for example, somebody who uh, is in the majority and in the position of privilege to take a step back and pay attention to how others might feel and pay attention to how they're affecting their surroundings and the people around them. I'm going to push on you for one second there. You just used a term, um, just so I can understand it. I, I think I do, but perhaps our audience may not. What do you mean by privilege? As you suggest, that as a white male student, white male, that there's a certain privilege associated with that. What does that mean? Because you live in the town of Needham that you're privileged, or is it your, 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 your color? What, what, what do you mean by that? Um, well, both are factors, but I think that ultimately privilege is, um, comes with power, uh, money, e economic situation, all of these things that even, even if you don't necessarily have all of them, they come to you more easily if you are, uh, if you appear to be a member of um, the white race because and a male and straight and all of these things are factors because I just know from personal experience that we are all to some extent programmed by the past, by the media, by the way things are presented in biased textbooks that are a little outdated and the news and so on that's just trying to make profit. A lot of times we're kind of program to see someone and judge them unconsciously and not realize that we're making a judgment that isn't based on fact but is based by a, on our own prejudice and often um, we do that because we have the privilege to do it it won't affect us we're not going to be threatened and I know from speaking to people from other backgrounds and different skin colors and different uh, cultures that um, many people have to stay vigilant and aware of their their racial identity every day just to survive and feel safe. So, Zendili, I, I want to ask you, do you feel that you're treated differently 
in the Needham community. And I'm going to say, now, have you been here since kindergarten? Since kindergarten. Since your kindergarten. Yeah. Okay, so you've had the whole, as a senior, you've had all, mm -hmm. all 13 years. Have you been treated differently? I mean, what, what, what Jacob is suggesting is that perhaps as a white male, he's, he, he has kind of a different view and is treated differently. What's your personal experience in the Needham schools? I mean, and the I Needham feel community? Um, I feel like definitely what Jacob said, like there are some people that do get the pr extra privileges that a lot of people don't. Like I know like when I was little, I was always like so tired during school because I had to wake up every morning at like 5.30 and like go to school and I was always so exhausted. So like I remember like being like, I felt like I didn't have the privilege that everyone else had. Like they had all that sleep and I had to like wake up so early and come do this while they had all that extra time. So I was always like a little angry about that when I was little, but like growing up like Definitely, like, you do see some people that do have extra privileges. Like, I feel like I have to work extra harder in class just so I can get, like, the best grades that everyone else does. Just so I can, like, kind of prove that, like, I'm just as good as you are, even though, like, the color of our skin is different. How about, Tasha, what, what, what about you? Have you, have you had, have you had a, a personal experience where, where uh, you know, a feeling uh, like Zendeli said, where you've had to maybe work hard to catch up or, or, uh, or act differently? or? Well, my experience is similar to Sendley's and it's kind of similar to what Blessing just said. I remember in like, except it wasn't with a, it was like an incident with a teacher and, well, administration. And um, there was like an issue, whatever, we were talking it out. And the adult said to me that when my type of people get angry that the school is in danger. And I took that as, I took that pretty offensive. But like, and I told another teacher and that teacher told me that I was overreacting, but I didn't think I was overreacting because so I have to interrupt you. What is, what's my type of people? That's, what does that, mean? that was my question, too. Like, what are my type of people? And that really, it really hurt me. So what'd you, so what'd you do with that? What'd you do with that at, at Native, in, in the Needham schools? Where, where do you go with that? Well, I kind of just had to just take it because every teacher that I told told me I was overreacting to it, but I didn't see it as overreacting. You know, I've, I heard a term recently that some of you may know, you probably, you probably do, that sometimes these singular comments, like the comment that you heard is this, this quote unquote ghetto comment or, or you know, your people or, or whatever it might be, you know, a, a, a joke apparently, those um, are termed by some sociologists and psychologists as microaggressions. Have you, have you heard that term? That this one comment this one racist comment, even though it seems tiny and small and maybe even an overreaction, that they compound themselves over time, over one's life experience to really set in motion a theme or a feeling of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of you know, feeling that you know, you're under the microscope and you're being treated differently. Um, and it sounds like some of these comments fall into that category, as, as I understand it. Um, so you, now, who, who lives in Boston? Okay, um, you know you have to help me with one thing. I, I've been in Needham for eight years, and I have often, when when we talk about budgets and we talk about curriculum, we talk about students and we talk about uh, a variety of issues, and and uh, Boston students come up. Sometimes folks will say, "Well, it's the the Metco students or the the Metco program. It's Metco." I prefer to say our students from Boston because I, it seems to me METCO, a METCO student, it just immediately sets you to the side and puts you in a category. You know, I, I, say, I always say our Needham Public Schools students because that's who you are, but if someone had to differentiate, I'll say, well, our Boston resident students or our Needham resident students. So does that matter? Does it matter if it's METCO or what? I just, sometimes I hear it and it just comes out like METCO, like it's a, I don't know, almost a pejorative term, and, and maybe that's just by imagination. Well, I feel like, um, like definitely I've heard it like, oh, those MECO students are doing this. Like, yeah, it's derogatory, but on a different side, like, we're MECO students. It's part of our identity. Like, I'd rather embrace my MEC, like, that I am MECO because, you know, that's part of who I am. Like, that's what I've been growing up. And some people, like, I've, of course he said, like, oh, they're MECO students, but I'd, like, I'd rather embrace it because then I would just prove them like, oh yeah, like if you want to say, oh, they're MECO students, I'd rather like want to prove them wrong saying, oh wow, they're MECO students. Like, there's something to look up to, like over like overworking everybody else. So, yeah. 
that's very helpful for me to, to, to look at it that way and through your eyes. So that helps me kind of rethink this. Um, so, Zendili, and you, you suggested this getting up at 5.30 in the morning and, and uh, back as a kindergarten, first grader, second grader, you didn't understand that that was frustrating. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for, so, 13 years for mm -hmm. everyone? 12. 12 years, 13 years? 12. I mean, pretty extraordinary and exceptional it, it, from my, my perspective to, to have that level of commitment. And even as, as a little guy, you don't really know what the commitment is. You just you know, I'm supposed to get up, and so I get up, and I get on the bus, and I go to go to school. Um, not something I think what you were saying, Jacob, that you really had to think about necessarily early on, because you just got up and went to school. You know, at a at a reasonable reasonable time. Um, so that that journey, that all this time that you have spent uh, getting up early and then getting home late, um, how what what does that do, if I may, for you know the the other the big part of your life at home. What does that do for friendships at home? What does that do for family at home? What you you, you live in these in, the, in in a way two worlds. How how do you, how have you brought them together over time, or have you been able to? And I have a lot of questions. How do you get your Needham friends involved in your your Boston life? So I'm going to throw that open. There's a lot embedded in that. Well, I know for like myself, my parents really helped with that. Like my mom was always like, when I was in elementary school, she always like organized play dates. And so like she was always trying to make me like that socially active person. So like there was always something to do. Like I was always at a friend's house or they came over sometimes. Like my mom always had the house like really like opening so that people didn't feel like scared to like come and like come to Boston. But like she really welcomed them and made it like a really fun adventure for them. Like, we'd go to the zoo or like the aquarium. It'd be really fun. So you have, you, you visit friends in Needham and your friends mm -hmm. visit you in Boston. And so how, how'd that work? How does that work for the, for the rest of you? Well, for me, um, I don't use, I don't have people who, from Needham who would come to Boston, but as part of the track team for indoor track, we have our track meets at Reggie Lewis, which is in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. So that's like where I'm from. So um, like when people come over, I'm, o I'm able to say like, this is my staff, this is my city, this is my town, like this is what I do. So like I share with them and I'm like really open and like they learn new things like, oh, this is like where I like to eat. So um, I feel like that was my way of like showing them where I live and where I come from. And it was like really helpful because they, they they're like oh interested they were so interested and like wanted to know more about me and where I was from. How about you, Tasha? Yeah. Well, it's kind of the same as that. Really. Like I'd go over people's houses and people would come over my house. How about you? Man? Well, I I think there's a funny part. Like up until yesterday, it was the first time I had friends over, at, like ever in Boston for a soccer game, because they all had cars. Up until you yeah. Cause until yesterday. Yeah, oh, okay. and like I try to get like some of my friends to come over. They're like, oh yeah, like just come over for this game, and they're like, wait, I don't have a car. But, like, just take the train. And after they're like, the train? Like, they're making it like yeah. something like. There are four stops in the train in Needham, you know. Four stops. You could get on the yeah. train in four places. But even then, they're like, oh, the train. They're, it's just like <laughs> some magical place. Like, no, it, like anybody could take it, and we. And that's part of like sometimes that's part of like how I get home and. I'll never forget this. Like I remember in kindergarten, I would I could always like, go over to my friend's house. Like there was never an issue. Like my mom's like, all right, I trust you. You know, I'm my dad. Your dad's gonna pick you up this time. And then I'm like, oh, Jacob. Or whoops. So Jacob. <laughs> so um, not not the Jacob from. It was a different one. So uh, they're like, oh, Jacob. Uh, I asked him like, do you want to come over? And I remember he asked his uh, he asked his mom. He's like, oh mom. He's like, oh mom, can I come over? He's like to Boston. And after like I'm just a little kid. I'm like, yeah. And she's like. I don't trust. I don't trust it. You could get shot or something. And I like. I remember like I was. I think four or five. Even like at that young age, I'm like, are you serious? Like, have you ever been to Boston? Like, no. The chances of getting shot are like, the chance of getting struck by lightning. Like people be, like don't understand that Boston is anything like you. Like yeah, we might not have big houses or like three like three rooms and like just a huge backyard, but the surrounding wise like everybody's friendly and it's just not it's not like a war zone like people depict it as it's, it's not a foreign country it's not a war yeah, zone you don't need a passport isn't. to get into it so here here's a here's a question four of you are graduating and moving on from the Needham public schools experience Renato's going to remain my question for the four seniors is what what are the takeaways for us what are the things that i need to be paying attention to as superintendent of schools when it comes to issues of race for students or incidences that come up, cultural proficiency, 
What does Renato need to be thinking about as he takes over SEAL in, in, in his senior year? What are some key things? And I'm, I'm not just talking about Needham High School, but I'm, you reflect on your experience. What are some things, if you could whisper in my ear, here are the things you need to pay attention to, Mr. Superintendent. Well, I think that it's very important to like listen and make everyone feel like they're comfortable enough to speak about what's happening and like how they feel because I feel like when I'm comfortable speaking to you or any other teacher or superintendent, like I'll feel more part of the community and like I have something to share and like I feel a part of something. I think that's one really important thing because when I was able to open up and tell people how I felt, it made me feel better about myself and like where I came from and like that made me feel a part of the community. Okay. What else? What else should I be paying attention to? If a student says that something like makes them feel a specific way, don't like knock down what they're saying or like treat what they're saying as less, or, like that they're overreacting. Because it's like if it, if something if someone says something and it makes you feel a certain way, it makes you feel a certain way for a reason. Okay. I think definitely just paying attention to like every student's like needs, like. I know sometimes like some of the Boston residents or Mecca students will like complain about something and like they'll talk about it to someone but like nothing will be done and like it'll stay with them like talk to, like it like stays with you in your mind like you never forget it. So just kind of have like have that open mind and to, like be there for them if they need you. Well I think that education is important but not necessarily in the traditional sense. I think that um, we need to be learning how to care for each other on a very deep level. We need to understand that we all depend on each other's kindness and awareness, and we don't have a lot of that necessarily. We have a lot of facts and dates and tests right away as soon as we get to school, but we don't necessarily like sit in a circle and talk about our feelings once, ever. And it's something, that kind of approach might help people understand how others feel and develop you know, awareness and, and sympathy, empathy for the different struggles and journeys people have. For all kinds of different people. Well, I, as we conclude, I, I, I think it's a, all of your advice is, is, is wise to, for, for me to be open-minded, to make sure we're patient and listen to folks and give them time to express themselves. I think this whole notion of social justice, active listening is really my takeaway from this conversation. Embedded in that is this notion of cultural proficiency and really taking the time to learn about one another regardless of who we are or our background. Uh, I am thrilled that the five of you are leaders at Needham High School starting this conversation. I look forward to Renato's leadership next year and uh, for you to come back and see how we're going about our journey. Thanks very much. Thank you.